So, hey, thanks so much, Marianne. Fantastic. Oh. <laughs> Valerie, are we, are we ready? Yes, I'm here. And by the way, did you get the list that Christian sent? I did. Thank you so much. Thanks, Christian. Yeah, thanks, Christian, very much. So should we, um, do you want to, I mean, do you feel like you want to just dive right in, Valerie? Do you want to? Sure, sure. Um, shall we have, yeah, Christian read the first one? Sure, if that's, that's, yeah. Is that okay with you, Christian? Yes, of course. Um, as I understand it, our practice is to be aware, present to whatever arises, thoughts, emotions, sensations, without picking and choosing. The more we do, the more we more awake we become, notwithstanding the fact that we are already endowed with Buddha nature. It is a case of already and yet. Hence, it is not wrong to say that we become more transparent to the light, more enlightened. Is this correct from a Zen point of view? Shall I say something, Henry? Or... Yeah, by all means. Yeah, please. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it's a, a clear statement of um, this present moment awareness, this um, practice of uh, you know, the space of the unconditioned, that great freedom. Uh, and then this, I, I like the image of transparency. Um, in a sense, we just uh, naturally become more and more who we are. I mean, it's, it's a strange thing. <laughs> How could we not be it? You know, we are it. It is you. Uh, you know, and yet there's this longing, I want to be my true self. Um, I, I do like this image from Yamada Kon Roshi of the, uh, you know, I've said it before that it's as though we're sitting in a, you know, room of darkened glass and this practice uh, as described, you know, really relinquishing, being with things just as they are, present moment awareness does the glass uh, the darkened glass gets gradually lighter, more and more transparent. Um, you know, as as you said clearly, Henry, uh, a number of times and in different ways, I have too. I think there there is um, nevertheless a sudden shift that can, you know, really create an opening in that wall, or maybe even make it fall. Uh, And, you know, we're talking about this and I, I think it's, it can be helpful, you know, this awakening to an awake world, the language, I mean, that we've inherited it. Um, but I just recently read an article, it was just a little, uh, ran across a Q&A like this with Joko Beck. So we, some years ago, obviously, and uh, a student, you know, somewhat new, a new student just asked, said, are you enlightened? And immediately she said, well, I should hope I've never had such a thought. And it was not, it was a very kind thing. It was completely open and honest. I mean, um, I, I, you know, I perhaps didn't convey her spirit. I, mean, I, I just, it was just so honest and true. And so when I read this question, that was the only place I stumbled was um, this thing of enlightened. Mm. It is, uh, it's, it's like carrying something around that's extra. Yeah, 
Thanks. Thanks so much, Valerie. <clears throat> um, Christian, should we, might we hear the next one? Are you, is that okay with you? If we observe our thoughts and realize they're not real and come back to this exact moment, can we somehow also lead the mind to naturally start shifting to more loving thoughts and self-talk? Or is it better to have none? Um, <clears throat> should, I, should I try to yes. adjust this? Yeah, okay. Um, if we observe our thoughts and realize they're not real, I mean, I, I'm not sure even that's quite how I would phrase it. I mean, you know, thoughts are a phenomenon. You know, they are, a, whether it's speech in the mind or images in the mind, um, they are arising when they arise, you know? And so uh, maybe what I might say is there, there can be a point or, you know, repeated point when we realize that we've been very identified with our thinking you know, really feeling that somehow the thought stream is, is part of myself or kind of is myself. And we can definitely become much less identified with it and see them as simply things arising, phenomena arising that aren't in some way us any more than anything else. And that's quite a liberating um, thing to no longer be caught up in intense identification with what we think. It's very important, I'd say. So that's one point. And then, and then, and then it's yes. When the moment we realize thoughts, when, the moment we see them for what they are, which is speech in the mind, an image in the mind, basically. You know, some musicians might also hear you know, tunes, melodies, etc. And if you've been listening to some song a lot, you might, you might hear it um, in your mind. And so it doesn't have to only be words, but essentially that's the main phenomenology of thought. Um, and once we see that, yeah, we, we are back in the present moment. We're no longer caught in thought. You know, the, the, the peculiarity or partic particular challenge of thinking for a practice of present, present moment awareness is that thinking, if we don't see it as a set of phenomena, can very easily uh, pick us up and carry us off uh, out of present moment experience. So it, it is a it is an interesting, you know, part of meditation to get um, a little more adept, which happens, you know, realizing, oh, I've been on a train of thought. And then allowing ourselves a moment of appreciating the fact that we've disengaged from the train of thought, we've hopped off, we're back in the here and now. And that's good. I mean, there may be a tendency for us as beginning meditators when we realize we've been on a train of thought to focus more on the fact that we have been lost in the train of thought think, oh darn i got lost again that's actually wrong much more important is the fact that we've hopped off the train of thought i'm back here and so give yourself a you know really nice pat on the back i'm back and experience what it's like to be back here and now um and, you know, related, a related and very important topic, actually, is the role of emotion in identification with thinking. It's a, it's a, it's a very important thing. But then, the, the, so, yes, coming back to the present moment, this exact, yeah, just this moment, you know, just this moment. It doesn't have to be exact. You know, it's just, I mean, it just is this moment. When we're back, we're back. Um, can we somehow also lead the mind to naturally start shifting to more loving thoughts and self-talk? Oh, I see. Or is it better to have none? So in other words, I think the question is like, 
is it okay to have loving thoughts and loving self-talk, kind self-talk, or should we just be having no thoughts? Well, I would reframe it really. First of all, there, there is the practice of being aware of present moment experience. And in that practice of you know, usually called mindfulness, um, we, we're not actually as a common notion. We're trying to have no thoughts. No, we're trying to be more aware of the experience of this moment to experience this experience. And sometimes this experience includes the arising of thoughts. And our, it's true that our main challenge to experiencing this experience is getting lost in thought. Um, and um, therefore, being more aware, being more mindfully attuned to the contents of this moment, including the arising of thoughts, is the, is the practice. We're, we're cultivating that. Now, what about deliberately practicing loving thoughts towards others and towards oneself with practices like metta or loving kindness practice? where actually we do, you know, deliberately run speech of certain kinds through the mind in a, and sometimes actually there's meta practices where we uh, maybe not so much use speech, but use scenarios. You know, we might imagine being in a stressful situation. It could have speech, it doesn't have to. And then you imagine a dear, dear friend walking into the room or a dear beloved mentor walking into the room, you know, something like that, you know, so it doesn't actually have to be talk and you just see what does it feel like to have a kind, loving presence step in. So we start to feel the difference between having a warm heart and having a constricted heart, a warm open heart versus a constricted heart. And this is um, actually, I'd say this can be very helpful. Um, so do you get the idea that, you know, there's, there's not only one, one practice, you must do this, you know, it's actually, there's a, there's a, I don't know how many tens of thousands of different practices they are, there are within the one word meditation, you know, um, and there are broad categories for sure. Um, so I don't know, I hope that's, and so, you know, there's times when, it's probably more useful actually to bring in a, a kindness towards oneself by whatever means than to be just trying to have no thought. And even then I wouldn't really put it that way. Be trying to be aware of what's happening in this moment would be the main um, project. So even when let's say we've got a single focus practice like following the breath, um, we assume that we won't be perfectly focused on the breath from here till the end of our lives. No, we're expecting to be open to finding what the mind does while it's ostensibly given an, an attention task like that. That's part of our growth and learning. Okay, yeah. Should we, should we go on, Valerie? Or, yes, I think yeah. I, one, one quick comment is I've just been in, um, even recently known students who sat with Mu and were seriously practicing with Mu and uh, took up a meta practice and something cleared away on the path to Mu from that practice. Just oh, yeah, that's a, yeah. Thank you so much. That's a great point to share. Yeah. Oh, that's very good to hear. Yes, yes. I, I always think actually the the more mu is a sort of heart practice, possibly the better. You know. Yes. Christian. 
It occurred to me on a walk that language fools us into forgetting that we are nature, and that I'm looking for ways to reconnect to that pre-linguistic, non-mediated relationship to experience. Can you recommend a practice for getting underneath or before language? to get on the other side of conceptual thinking into a more direct, less hardened relationship to experience. I'm aware that Cohen practice is perhaps precisely this. <laughs> As his present moment awareness uh, just leaps to mind, you know, this um, before thinking, before knowing, uh, so really this uh, here and now it can be so such so thoroughly imbued with that resting in uh, you know that without the story um, and you can even you know I mean there are variations on it but learn to catch the moment before the, you know, just before some um, thought arises, a particularly uh, a laden thought, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a wonderful practice. Uh, but I, I this, this just throws me right back to, to present moment awareness. And the reality of our experience is um, you know, this sort of, again, when, when, it, when we can touch and taste that space of the unconditioned, it's just walking in the woods if that's what you're doing. Uh, you know, it, it, it's just whatever is coming up uh, to, to really uh, taste that is, is so wonderful. Yeah, if I may, oh, yes. can I? Yeah, it's. I just want to. I think just very much what you've just been saying. I mean, I think this question is conveying an actual important moment, right? You're walking in the woods, you say, questioner, and and you suddenly realize it occurred to me that language fools us into forgetting that we are nature. Yeah, there it is. Don't. Um, I would say don't jump to a general rule or something just appreciate that moment when you suddenly realize this very important point yeah language maybe language is the veil <laughs> or maybe the veil is greatly fueled by language and here's a moment of whoa yeah. what if i'm stop what if i if the talk stops what if the, look at it, ah, it just stopped. Ha, huh. I'm nature. <laughs> I mean, this, this is a moment, you know, don't, and then you think, oh, well, how can I, how can I do this more? What's the rule here? <laughs> no rule, no rule. You know, what's the, what's the right practice here? You're doing it. Yeah. You know, this, all these practices are not, then in a way, they're not that important in themselves. They're about your existence, your life. They're not, they're not, um, I mean, in a way, sort of forget the practice. It's just a means. It's not the thing. The thing is you and what you are and not, and having more huh, intimacy with that. And, you know, we can, we can, in a sense, discover more and more, perhaps endlessly, I don't know, about what we are, especially as we're releasing language and the concepts, the con construct constructional concepts that are buried in it, implicit in it, that make us think we know certain things about this moment, this experience oh. here oh. and now. and basically we're wrong we, we don't know the things we think we know no, i mean we 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 think we know the things we know and that's wrong <laughs> and and this is a you know this is like a cat's cradle 
do you have that phrase in America? Like yeah, when yeah. kids make little, you know, things. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a cat's cradle yeah. of concepts about what this life is, meaning what this moment is. And moo or breath or present moment awareness or walking in the woods or whatever it might be, it can snip, snip that. Yeah. All the threads fall away. Yeah. Just one more thing, and when that happens, you know, when this snipping, this falling away, um, then what you, you, you know, that identification, that construct, what we think we know, language itself can become mutable, you know, mobile, mutable, uh, as alive and poetic as the trees. You know, I am that. <laughs> uh, I, I think, uh, you know, yeah, it's the scaffolding and it's the, it's the way we reify it and the way we think we know. And you drop that and it's, it's like a kind of music, can be. Yeah. Hence the koans, actually. Yeah. 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 Well, how about, should we go on? Yes. First, I want to express my gratitude that there is Q&A. I studied a long time under an autocratic Zen teacher without that opportunity. So that I've never been able to 100% release the tension in my jaws and shoulders. I feel like that is a gateless gate I have to go through to deeper realization. How can I do that? Is it simply to go deeper and deeper and letting go? Or are there practical things I should do, or both? Valerie, should I should I yes, pick yes. that? Go ahead. So, so, um, I want to just um, just note, you know, the autocratic Zen teacher comment. I mean, I think a number of us may have known that kind of style in our years of training. I certainly have done. Um, and I just want to say that it's got its wisdom too. You know, we might sort of object on many, any number of grounds to that. And it can certainly go horribly wrong uh, to being caught in sort of autocratic vortex of power. It can go very, very wrong. And we know that it has done in various uh, cases in, in spirituality, not just in Zen, generally, you know, really ghastly cult-like vortices of disempowerment and over empowerment and and um you know but also there there may be wisdom you know i mean when i think of how um soko morinaga was trained and how he trained one one of our dharma brothers valor and i bruce harris you know yeah it was i think it was pretty autocratic but actually it there was a it was quiet, it was a small place, maybe autocratic, but man, it was very, very helpful. So it's not quite so simple to just, you know, dismiss that, but that's a sideline, I know. It's really a question is, how do I release the tension in my jaws and shoulders? And the one answer, I mean, what occurs to me immediately is that, you know, you might look at things other than sitting. I mean, you can, you can do what you can do in sitting, great, um, but, you know, why, what about some somatic work or what about some rolfing or, I don't know, you know, a deep, deep massage? I mean, there's, there's many modalities that might address it a bit more directly. I'd say, as for sitting, I don't know whether the kinds of visualization I've been trying to get us to do, you know, where you just, I mean, you could just close your eyes and taste it now, you know just having the head, the skull be buoyant. You could imagine the, the cranium like a parachute in an updraft, spreading filling, and all other parts of the skull can sink beneath it. And see if you can just get a little warmth in the jaw. Don't, don't go for too much, just taste, 
some kind of warm, mild release in the jaw. And maybe you get a sense of the, this lower mandible sinking, maybe a sixteenth of an inch by itself, becoming heavy. And meanwhile, the throat becomes soft and that softness spreads into the shoulders and down the arms. You could, you could just try running, you know, it's a kind of a little visualization. You could just try running that every time you sit, but don't be, if you, if you're trying too hard, it's going to be counterproductive. You know, you'll end up getting tense about trying to relax, you know, that, especially when it's that part of the body. Maybe it's better just to relax your belly. Don't worry about the jaw. Go for the belly. Let it be floppy. Feel <laughs> like a big sail feeling an empty, you know, something like that. Yeah, uh, so beautiful. And I uh, thank you so much for your guidance, Henry. Um, it's really, really, I came up in a tradition that didn't do that. And um, it's, it's just been this wonderful discovery. And uh, oh, we can do this. <laughs> it's so helpful to do it myself when I sit now at the beginning of every sit, uh, just uh, I, usually silently somehow. I'm not doing the kind of language instruction, but just the sensation and the balance. Um, it's, it's really helpful. Um, I just read two, two other little things in this. One is the, the opportunity if to, to sense that this release in jaw and shoulders may be a gateless gate. It, there may be an opening for me in that I have this instinctive sense that there's something here that you know is so available and intimate to my experience and inviting me to a state of wonder about you. On the other hand, um, there's no ultimatum. I mean, you know, you can have a very deep um, experience without perfect posture. Uh, I, I mean, this is exactly a, a place of, of tension that I've always had back in my flute playing days, something I had to work out, lots of Alexander technique, I really found that helpful with sitting. Um, but if I had said, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just not gonna, you know, really drop through Mu until, <laughs> for example, or get this koan until, um, you know, really encounter this, uh, that, that would have been such an artifice. So, mm. uh, there, you know, I hear, I just hear two sides here. One is the, the the sense of wonder and invitation, and the other is, oh man, don't don't set anything up because, um, yeah, you know, it, it's a feature of your sitting. Probably you can explore it, and especially because you're interested, drawn to it, and uh, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Valerie. Okay. Uh, how about another Christian? With solstice and end of year, time drops into my mind, especially Dogen in the Ujjayi, or Ujjayi chapter in the Shobogenzo, the being time or maybe existing time. Can you say a few words about being time? Go ahead, Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> a few words. <laughs> this Uji. Uh, sometimes for the time being or being time with Dogen's, you know, great famous fascicle in the Shoba Genzo. And uh, it's, it's really dense. It's wonderful to read it in, in several different translations. Uh, the, the experience that I can speak to in it is, you know, uh, you are time. This is, you know, we keep talking about now, how everything is now. Or 
I was, you know, how uh, when this awakening that only comes up now at that very moment, all of the, all the past and all the future is also awakening and all the mess, it's all right here, it's here. And, you know, that's, that's real. <laughs> Uh, this cushion is time. This computer is time. There's no other time. There's, there's no other. There's nothing like this thing that we think goes faster or slower or uh, is particulate or we have to catch up with it or, you know, uh, uh, we can lose it, um, that there's not enough of it. Uh, it's, you know, we have all these ideas about time and um that that chapter is is so clear again and again that, that you know this is time <laughs> this experience these sense experiences are nothing but that and you know it it's not a matter of good or bad it's like you're if you're frustrated you're realizing that's it <laughs> you know it's perfect frustration that uh, but I've uh, I have never uh, given a, a, a talk on Uji I you know this is I hope that our, our dear friend and uh, teacher John Gaynor will write his book there are there's a lot written on this and uh, yeah but this this it's a freedom around both what it is, what being is and what time is. What would you say, Henry? I know you're much yeah. more cogent. Not at all, <laughs> far from it. That's beautiful, Larry. I, I mean, I, I've, I feel the same way really that this moment, I mean, meaning this, yeah. you know, actually the, you know, the words are so inadequate, but moment, it's sort of rubbish really, it's this. Yeah. It doesn't work. This, yeah. This is time. So, um, ah, you are time. You, you said that beautifully, Valerie. I, you know, I, 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 I agree. Um, you know, there's some sense in which, uh, and actually it just reminded me of um, this friend of mine, you know, not, 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 a, not a dear close friend, but, you know, he's, he's a, he is a bit of a friend, Kaz Tanahashi. He's, translated somewhere no it wasn't a translation he actually came up with this phrase what awakening or enlightenment i think he said is continuing to something like continuing to appreciate the infinite value of each moment or something yeah. like that it's a bit wordy but i think it conveys something important you know that just this here now is of infinite value, yeah. infinite value. And, and, and somehow also the infinite value of each being somewhere is in his definition. Yeah. I, I don't know whether that's really, but I think it honestly, you know, you can see this for yourself. I, I think it's it's uh, not something to challenge yourself with. It comes clear at times, you know, that time itself is you. It's, and, and time itself is this. It can become clear. Yeah. Don't, don't strive for it, just, but, and it may not, it doesn't matter really, but it might. It's a wonderful invitation to before knowing. Yeah. Okay, what, what about another? How, how are we doing, by the way, in terms of... Because um, um, I think there's probably more than... Yeah, let's let's keep going and see if we can more or less sort of uh, see. We might we might manage to t taste all of them. Yeah, yeah I think there's uh, there's five more. Oh, 
let's see how we do let's let's keep, <laughs> let's let's be just uh we'll be kind of kind of brief yeah Try to just hit hit at some point may i ask a naive question after kensho or as a zen master does one still become sometimes impatient for instance snipping in minor ways with one's family and a follow-up does one then have legitimate conflicts with other people and how does that play out well like i you know i would like to i don't know about after kensho or as a zen i mean certainly i mean kensho we usually think of as an initial experience that's going to be followed by a whole lot of training and um i don't know about as a zen i mean i i i would think that that's a beautiful aspiration both parts of that and uh, certainly something we'd be trying to hold ourselves to better and better but i mean i, I as far as sort of an ideal of a oh, man i'll tell you when i get there if it's possible you know i mean i i i, I think i can honestly say that um my you know my 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 sort of behavior in the household you know has definitely improved and i think claire my wife would agree you know very significant improvement over the years over the decades and maybe there are certain key moments in my zen practice actually that really made a major difference that has endured but oh, i would love to never never get impatient again <laughs> i would love that and i do aspire to that honestly and um no i'm not there yet but i don't know about, about legitimate conflicts oh well i mean you know i've spoken about about old uh, trump you know and i <laughs> I, mean, i don't know if that's exactly a conflict but i certainly you know, can get quite heated about, you know, somebody spreading, inciting violence and hatred. And um, I, you know, yeah, I get a certain heat in my chest when I think about that kind of thing. And anyway, Valerie, how about you? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't um, know to tie this to um, just one experience, though they, they really as you say, um, things shift, but over time with this practice, I've known, I've, I've mentioned this, um, you know, people come to mind who've been sitting 30 years more uh, and who either haven't had an opening or won't accept the opening that they've had, but have become more and more bodhisattva in the world. So more soft, uh, more accepting, uh, more humor, more grace, grace. Um, you know, this practice does that. It can do that. It's very natural that it, it does that. Uh, but it's not a, a cure-all. It's, you know, we're human. We're, we're so human. And I, you know, I have really experienced a, a change in um, how impatient I am with other people. Uh, and I think more grace for myself, but I, I also struggle with, um, or I don't, I, the political scene and political figures and leaders, um, I, I have to navigate, you know, that uh, sometimes sort of with skillful means. So instead of it just being my own spontaneous, you know, the, the gracious gratitude humor that comes from uh, this wonderful practice, uh, you know, it's more skillful means. It's, you know, noticing. And sometimes, you know, anger can be energy for change. So to turn it toward that instead of assumptions about somebody uh, who's who's doing things that I think are really damaging, really harmful, really dangerous. Um, so just kind of there's a there's a a way that this practice does 
teach us kind of naturally to, to step back before reacting. Um, but I, um, there's, a, there's a passage from Dogen <laughs> that I have quote a lot and I don't think I've quoted it yet. <laughs> this in these four days is really short, but he talks about Shakyamuni Buddha. Uh, um, you know, he's our ancestral pair and he's muddy and wet from following and chasing after the waves of suffering beings. It can be described like this, you know, that bodhisattva way just down in the mud. Uh, but also there is the principle of the way, this is Dogen, that we must make one mistake after another. What's that like? Whether Buddha is present or not present, I trust Buddha is right under our feet. Face after face is Buddha's face for fil fulfillment. After fulfillment is Buddha's for fulfillment. I mean, there's this, you know, mistake after mistake after mistake. <laughs> or that line in the, from Mumon, even in failure, an elegant performance. <laughs> Oh, just, yeah, this is how it is. Okay, Christian, should we take another two or three? Or let's see how we do. Thanks, Valerie. Marvelous. Would you please speak about approaching post Kensho koan practice? I mean, we just do it. You know, we got we got five books of koans we work through. They help to integrate an experience and they may trigger others. That's all I have to say. Do it. You know, when, when you're ready, you do it and it's great. Do it with a teacher. Yeah. 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 You learn to embody the cards and presenting them to the teacher with the teacher. This is a marvelous treasure of this tradition. How about the next one? To me, there is a difference between a state of gratitude and true gratitude. State of gratitude can be connected to desire. So how do we cultivate a state of gratitude without desire? This is a little weird for me because I, I tend to find... Um, you know, if desire's absent, it's so, it's, it's, you know, gratitude is welling up, is what I typically find. I don't know what this gratitude with desire, I'm not sure I can really, how about you, Valerie? Can you tune into that? Well, as you were reading that, I remembered um, many moons ago, uh, a conversation about prayer, different context, and um, I had to write a paper, and I was like, what, you know, and so I was, um, you know, joking with my partner, who um, had, you know, no interest in the topic of prayer, but just said, oh, that's when first you say thank you, and then you ask for more stuff, <laughs> <laughs> just so great. <laughs> I actually started the paper like that and then unwound that. No, you know, genuine gratitude is, it's just not conditional. It, it, it's just, it, it's kind of a, a state of being. Yeah, I suspect, again, there could be sort of different levels, flavors of gratitude. I mean, one might be, what about the gratitude and relief when, you know, a loved one comes through something, some challenge? Yeah. You know, and that's, I see that as 100% real. Yeah. And, and, but there's also unconditional gratitude when, you know, there's no particular, um, you know, particular reason for feeling grateful, except the very fact that you're existing. Yeah. This moment is arising. This is arising. This, this, yeah. this is arising. And some way this is actually, it seems to be just sort of, uh, it, 
it almost like it is itself a kind of gratitude. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. You've talked about that sometimes. Yeah. Beautiful. I, both of those beautiful uh, expressions um, are connected to compassion. like the you know close sibling if you wanted to talk about it that way yeah 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 thank you thank you i sometimes said that there's this sort of holy triad of gratitude compassion and humility mm. that all seem to sort of feed one another in a healthy way but hey should we yes Take another. Yeah. This is a final question. What do you think of using psychedelics to deepen practice? Valerie, can I speak to that? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. There was um, I've known a couple of students um, while training with me who, no, it's more than a couple, several who were really kind of stuck in some way, you know, whether in one case it was depression and another, it was just sort of recurring anxiety or something. And I, I forget the particularities of the others. And one, one of these people or two actually have done research retreats where psilocybin was administered on day four or something in a double blind experiment. So, neither the researchers nor the participants knew if they were getting a placebo or the real thing. And it was very carefully conducted research of a university in Europe somewhere uh, during a session. And um, the results were staggering. I mean, I, he was so helped, one of these people. And uh, I'm trying to remember now who the other was, it's just escaping my mind, but I know they were also helped and but the research showed taken in that kind of context um it was profoundly helpful for people and they compared that with people taking psilocybin not in the midst of a zen retreat and they also compared it with the placebo folks in the zen retreat and so they kind of compared every which way and the results were they were pretty damn good that this could really help with emotional and psychological troubles and disorders. And um, I mean, I think there's a whole field of research being reopened. I, mean, I think this is not news probably to anybody. After decades of being closed, you know, there's the guy at Johns Hopkins, I've forgotten his name now. And there's other centers that are doing, I mean, universities that are doing really deep research into the use of psilocybin the use of psilocybin and other hallucinogens, but really for, it's sort of more for um, therapeutic ends, but it's kind of, kind of touches on our practice because often people have what they would call, broadly speaking, sort of spiritual experience, you know, life-changing experiences that really help in the, in various ways that they're starting to measure, you know, three months on, nine months on, et cetera. And um, life change index, they call it, where you start to appreciate life more, you appreciate death more, you're less concerned with material welfare, more compassionate. They have these measures and they're, you know, they're finding that, yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, how important was this experience to you, you know, and so on. All these measures that they're not, I don't think, personally, I think it's very rare that somebody actually has Kensho under a hallucinogen. That's a spe specific seeing through the self. But it's common that people have some of the kind of associated benefits of Kensho in, in the right context. That seems to be what the research is showing. Um, but, uh, you know, that is so, so the question is slightly different is how helpful can it be in the context of being in a committed practice. And I think it's helpful in different ways, you know, mostly therapeutic, because I've also seen people who had what, you know, was quite like, had some of the elements of a Kensho, but not all the way through. Uh, and it didn't actually 
didn't seem to actually help them. And if, for example, if they were sitting with Moo, you know, I don't know whether you have experience of this, Valerie, or of interest to you. Oh, I, no, I, I think the context really matters. And I think the therapeutic intention is, um, yeah, you have to really know what you're doing or be in a context of, of support. Uh, I've also, I've, I've known students also who have long, deep, even monastic training, you know, years of sitting with Mu, but had um, clinical depression and uh, of course resisted any kind of medication because they didn't want to interfere with seeing reality with this, you know, just raw practice. And uh, a friend of mine, after, you know, two decades, I mean, you know, was at Thich Nhat Hanh's place for more than 10 years, uh, back at another monastery, finally uh, agreed to take, um, you know, antidepressants under a doctor's care and the next session had a very clear experience. Uh, but I would not, you know, I, this makes me a little uncomfortable because if you go out and say, well, I think I can artificially, you know, uh, just just take a pill and it's gonna, you know, that's crazy thinking and um, not helpful. But I, I just wanted to offer that. I think that's really, it's your whole person and every aspect of it. Uh, Yeah, but at the same time, we can get caught in loops, you know, as we know, and um, sometimes a sort of, you know, an interruption is yeah. really helpful. Yes, um, absolutely. Isn't it good that we're coming more and more into yeah, uh, breaking down that dyad of, um, you know, legal and illegal, healthy, helpful and not helpful, as if, you know, these categories that uh, I'm just very grateful to see that happening in our culture. And I think there'll be more and more research. Yes, yes. <sighs> okay, so <laughs> I think we've got time for another sit. So now why don't we pause it here um, with huge thanks to you, Christian, and of course to you, Valerie. And let's uh, get ourselves ready fairly, you know, maybe like sort of, you know, sort of shortish order, like in a minute or two, and we'll do a final sit. I'm going to suggest of maybe just a little under 20 minutes. So we have some time at the end to greet one another and so on. And we could leave the Zoom open with everybody unmuted at that point for some hellos and goodbyes and so on. How about that? Sounds great. Okay. Thanks all. <laughs>